All right, I think I'm ready. <laughs> uh, good morning and happy Sabbath class. Good to see everybody today. Uh, we're going to just start out with a word of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you today for this Sabbath day, Father. We just ask for your blessing to be upon us, Lord. We need your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and our minds to give us wisdom and understanding of the book of Isaiah that we're about to uh, study. I ask that uh, you will make our hearts pliable, Father, and that our minds will have understanding as we do this lesson study. Bless us, Lord, I pray, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to start out with the memory text, and the memory text is found in uh, Isaiah 37, verse 16, and it reads, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Okay, so I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, I'm not going to give a whole lot of explanation on the verse other than the fact that it is basically telling us that God is the one who controls the kingdoms of the earth. Um, okay, so um, it's just giving us a brief a little opening to the narrative we're about to embark on, but uh, I'm just going to read right through it. A gaunt man walks barefoot with, two, with his two sons. Another family has located all their belongings onto an ox cart pulled by emanci excuse me, <laughs> emaciated oxen. A man leads the oxen while two women sit on the cart. Less fortunate people have no cart, so they carry their possessions on their shoulders. Soldiers are everywhere. A battering ram smashes into the city gate. Archers on top of the ram shoot at defensor, or defenders on the walls. Hectic carnage reigns supreme. Fast forward, a king sits grandly on his throne, receiving booty and captives. Some captives approach him with hands upraised, pleading for mercy. Others kneel or crouch. Depictions of these scenes with the king begin with these words. I always get stuck with this one, but I'll get it right. <laughs> uh, Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria, and continue with such expressions as sat in the ne Nem Nemedu throne and the booty of the city lashes past in review before him. Um, what we're looking at is uh, the condition of of Israel at this time. And remember, when I say Israel, I'm saying as a whole, but we know that Israel, um, right before the, what we're looking at, was the 10 tribes, or excuse me, the, the northern tribes of Israel had apostatized. They had done so many wicked things, the violence amongst them, the apostasy, the idol worshiping, all of the things that they had done. Imagine how bad it must have been because of what happened to those tribes of Israel. Disappeared forever. Uh, excuse me? Ten tribes gone. The ten tribes, the ten northern tribes were gone. The only two that remained were the southern tribes of, of uh, Benjamin and Ephraim. Okay, so in that, that particular southern tribe, of course, was uh, Jerusalem was the capital. So keep in mind, Jerusalem's the capital. I'm going to mention it once again. Jerusalem's the capital of the southern kingdom. And of the northern kingdom, the capital was Samaria. Okay? So at this point, Assyria had already come and besieged and taken captive all of those ten tribes. And we know that eventually uh, those tribes disappeared forever to this day. Um, and that all happened because of the state that they were in according uh, to the Bible that tells us about the apostasy that was going on. And go into the books and look at those things. Read Prophets and Kings, um, Ellen G. White's writings on the Assyrian captivity. And you'll see how bad, I'm not going to go into detail of the things, but you'll see how bad they were. And as I said, it must have been so bad that they utterly just took them all into captivity and those ten tribes were never again. So Judah at this point is, has survived. By the way, just let me give a quick little, uh, little insight on um, 
on uh, Hezekiah because we're looking at Hezekiah. Who, who was uh, Hezekiah the son of, by the way? You familiar with King Ahaz? Okay, that's who his father was. Is King Ahaz a good king or a bad king, by the way? He was not a good king. One of the worst, yes. Um, and by the way, contrasting that would be Hezekiah, who the Bible says was one of the, one of the best and the last of the best. Um, so Ahaz was his father, who previously was king before him, but keep in mind that at, at one point they, they ruled together. Okay, So at, at some point until, of course, Ahaz dies. So Hezekiah's reign was during the time of four kings, and the four kings, um, give me one second here, I'm sure I have it. Um, the four kings that he ruled during his reign were Uzziah, uh, also known as Azariah, um, and his son Jotham, and his grandson, who was Ahaz. Um, so Uzziah, the Bible says, was a good king. Jotham was a good king. Ahaz was a bad king. And then you have Hezekiah, who ends up being a good king. So the point I want to make here is, you know, when we read the book of Chronicles and King, First and Second Kings, and even when we read Isaiah and some of the prophets, you know, we see this pattern of kings that come into to Israel and, and Judah, and the pattern is always like good king, bad king. You know, and sometimes good king, good king, sometimes bad king, bad king. But the pattern is always up, down, up, down. And these are God's people, you know, and it, it's hard to realize how is it that God's people, the ones that have the oracles of God, they're supposed to be the ones that are supposed to be an example to all the nations around them, to the world. Um, but they end up being a people that are all about power, wealth, self-gratification, all of these things that are totally contrary to God and God's teachings. How is it that they could be so bad? Um, which, by the way, uh, when the Assyrian captivity um, happened, uh, some of those people had actually fled into Judah, okay? Um, so keep in mind that not all of the people in Judah were the ones that hadn't apostatized. These were some of the people that had apostatized that had fled into Judah for protection, okay? So they didn't all get carried away, but most of them got carried off into, uh, into Assyria. Okay, so the point I wanted to make about the good king, bad king thing is is, isn't it interesting how you can have somebody that's so bad and have something good come out of it? And vice versa, you can have something so good and have something so bad come from it? Yes, go ahead, brother. Yeah, yeah, how does... How does that happen? It's unexplainable. Yeah, yeah. It, it just happens, you know. Be, well, we do live in a world of yeah. sin, right? It's just like, you know, uh, if you look at Israel, they had 19 kings. Not one of them was good. And Israel was just a He said you can have a king, but... You can have it, but I want to tell you, you're going to regret it. <laughs> That's right. And they did. Yeah. And so I think, you know, first of all, this lesson is telling us that you need sound leadership. Okay? If you yeah. do not have sound leadership, it is destructive to the church mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And so we look at, you know, Judea, they had 20 kings. Seven of them were good kings. Right. Seven Which was the worst king ever, the Bible says. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. 
Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, brother. Um, okay. Um, so uh, let me just, I want to give a just a quicker overview because uh, what I really, I think that this lesson for some of us, myself included, can be, you know, when we do read Book of Kings and Chronicles, you know, there's so much going on and you have to find other locations to get in more information about what's really happening, okay? So I want to try to keep it a little bit on the more simple side so we don't get confused and so that we'll be able to understand what's really going on instead of like bouncing around and getting all this information. So I'm gonna just try to do that and we'll see how we end up. But um, let me just read a little bit of the, the, uh, the overview of what we're looking at today too. Um, so we're gonna talk about Isaiah for a second. Isaiah 36, that's what we're looking at today to 39 includes narratives de uh, detailing another military challenge that Judah faces. The event takes place during the reign of Hezekiah. Chronicles in the book of the Kings describe Hezekiah as a great reformer in terms of religious matters. He, in the first year of his reign and in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. When you read, uh, you get more insight in, in the book of Kings, you know, where Hezekiah takes the people when he comes into to, uh, to his rule. And uh, they go and they go out to all the places that his father had set up. Because what he was doing when he came in is he took all of the places that were places of worship and he put idols of Assyrian gods and other idols and gods and brought them in, okay? So Hezekiah ends up in his first year going in and taking them all down, breaking them in pieces, smashing them, demolishing them. Um, and uh, he, said to the, he said to the Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. The biblical record points out that he trusted in the Lord, God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah. It's pretty interesting, right? Hezekiah, so good king. Uh, was he perfect, though? No, he had a couple of, couple of little issues. But for the most part, yeah, the Bible says that he was, uh, there was none like him among all the kings. Uh, the Assyrian power has come up against Israel and Samaria is captured because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God but transgressed his covenant. However, the Assyrian forces come up against all the fenced cities of Judah as well it seems that hard circumstances surround good and bad people alike. For some reason, Hezekiah rebels against Syria. So keep in mind that well, we're going to see that at this time, you know, nobody could could come up against Assyria because they were, you know, they were the big dog now. And so Hezekiah ends up rebelling against the king where everybody else is trying to pay tribute to the king. Uh, his father did the same thing. They're trying to get help so that they would be spared. And so they all pay tribute, but Hezekiah decides that he's going to rebel against the king, you know, thinking that well, you know what? I got God on my side. And he trusted in the Lord, and he knew that God is able to deliver. And he believed that, and he knew that. Well, of course, he had Isaiah to help him with, with some of this stuff to, to lead him in the right direction. Um, so it reaches a high point. Rabshakeh, uh, the emissary of the king, uh, of the king, Sena... Sena Sennacherib, <laughs> I'll get it right before we're done. Sennacherib, Sennacherib, uh, comes to the king of Judah with a message that contains the crux of the matter in the narrative, in whom do you trust? So this is what um, Rabshakeh is telling them when he comes up to them. Um, in whom do you trust? There are some alternatives for Hezekiah to follow. Do you trust in Egypt? So number one, he asks him that. Do you trust in the Lord, or are you going to trust in the Assyrian king? The Assyrian agent explains to the leaders of God's people his reasoning as to why it is not convenient to trust in others, but only in him. 
Uh, he tells him, do not trust in Egypt because it is like the staff of his broken reed. Um, finally, the emissary of the Assyrian of Assyria persuades the representatives of Judah to trust in Assyria by making a deal with the Assyrians. Make an agreement with me by a present. So he asks for a gift. The, the king is saying, you know, give me a gift and uh, I'll give to you a land of corn and wine and a land of bread and vineyards. If Judah agrees to that, it would have shown its disdain for God. Okay, so I was just trying to give it a little bit of opening as to what this story is. It, the narrative here is what we're looking at. Um, so with that in mind, let's uh, go back to uh, Sunday's lesson. And Sunday's lesson is entitled Strings Attached. Second uh, Kings 18.13, Second Chronicles 32.1, and Isaiah 36.1. Um, would somebody like to take one of those or any of them and uh, have the opportunity to read it? Uh, it's Isaiah 36 1, 2 Kings 18 13, 2 Chronicles 32 1, yes. Okay, thank you, brother. Um, uh, verse 36, verse 1 reads, Sennacherib boasts against the Lord is the heading. It says, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So as I mentioned, he had already came and already took the northern kingdoms. Um, 2 Chronicles 32, 1 is what you read. 2 Kings 18, 13. Does anybody have that one by any chance? It says the same thing you just read. Yes, it does. But a little bit, a little bit different wording. So all we're looking at is it's just uh, showing us what ended up happening um, to Judah. Um, so the lesson tells us, so the question was, what happened to Judah? What happened to Judah? What did, what did we... Yeah, go ahead, brother. Why did uh, say that again? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Trying to uh, persuade, you know, uh, Hezekiah that uh, 
you know, taunting them, bullying them, trying to show them that, hey, look, you know, you don't have a chance, exactly. Um, so the lesson tells us that uh, Judah was forced to continue paying protection money. So as I mentioned, they were still paying protection money, but, as you mentioned, at this point, uh, Hezekiah decides, oh, we're not going to do, we're going to go against them. Um, so it tells us that the Assyri Assyrian king Sargon II died on a distant battlefield and was succeeded by Sennacherib. Uh, <laughs> Sennacherib. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, he was uh, succeeded. So that's who, who his successor was, was uh, Sennacherib in 705 B.C., uh, Assyrian appeared vulnerable. Appeared vulnerable. Uh, evidence from Assyrian and biblical texts reveal that Hezekiah seized this opportunity to rebel. Uh, so, taking aggressive action as a ringleader of an anti Assyrian revolt among the small nations in his region. Unfortunately for him, Hezekiah had underestimated the resilience of the Assyrian might in 701 BC when Sennacherib had subdued other parts of his empire, he lashed out against Syria, Palestine, with devastating force and ravaged Judah. Okay, um, Second Chronicles 32, 1 through 8. Let's take a look at that briefly. Second Chronicles 32, 1 through 8. I'm going to just read it just briefly so we'll see where we're at. Uh, but keep in mind the question is, how did Hezekiah prepare for a confrontation with Assyria? So let's find out. Um, after these deeds of faithless or faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. That was 32.1. Uh, let's see, we're going to go all the way to 8. Um, and when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem he, Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water. So this is what he did. So to stop the waters from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself, built up the wall that was broken, raised up the towers and built another wall outside. Also he repaired Milo and the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. Then he set military captains over the people, gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate and gave them encouragement saying, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more of us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah. So, he was a good absolutely, absolutely. So this is what he ends up doing. Um, so he knows that he's got God on his side. You know, the last line, verse 8, says, with him is an arm of flesh. So he's saying, you know, the king has men, you know, they're, they're just men of flesh. But with us, the Lord, God, the Lord our God to help us to fight our battles. So he's saying, we have God on our side. You just have, you know, the armor of flesh, people, right? But he says, I've got God on my side. <laughs> so he's confident, right? He's confident that God will deliver him. Um, so, and also, you know, it tells us that, you know, he builds up weapons, he takes the water and uh, sets it up inside of the city walls that he strengthens and so they'll have, so basically he cuts off the king's water supply for, for the outside armies that are coming upon them. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to read the bottom just briefly. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib intended to take Jerusalem, the capital city, he made intensive extensive preparations for a confrontation with Assyria. He strengthened his fortifications, further equipped and organized his army, and increased the security of Jerusalem's water supply. I'm just going to read down at the bottom. It says, but the king of Judah had determined to do his part. So 
even though God is going to, it will fight our battles, um, at times he does expect, at, there is times when God says, just be still and let me fight your battles. And there's times where we have to do our part. And this is what Hezekiah is doing. He's doing his part. You know, I remember watching uh, Doug Batchelor earlier in the week, not on the lesson study, but he was talking uh, for the first time I had seen where he was doing kind of like a motivational speaker, and he was saying a lot of positive uh, affirmations and stuff. But one of them that I remember that I liked was uh, he says, uh, you know, God makes the nuts that grow on the trees, but he doesn't break them. You know, so we have to do our part still, right? And so this is what Hezekiah is doing. He's doing his part, even though he knows, and he's prayed to God, and God said he would deliver. Um, okay, let's move on. Any, any comments so far? You know, what's interesting about that is that there is no indication in Isaiah or anyone else that when he came in the land, he was expected. He just did this. Yes. He felt it was right. Now, we all know faith in God. The latter part of that, like you just read, is that God made faith in that land. Yes. And this was not just any good old guy. And it was just plenty of faith. Can you imagine when he was in the field? Remember, when the field commands were filled, and the delegation to have prayer come in and go, look, there are nuts here that are uh, in need of super prayer. Mm -hmm. And they said that because the people weren't just digging it, they were praying for it. Mm -hmm. They were going along the tracks. And so they did. And so he said, no, 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 I'm just this, this, this little thing is just right. He's not here just to talk to me. He's right here to make my job easier. Mm -hmm. So he went there straight in front, and they did everything they did. And they had a simple little song that they had to sing. He said, he said, in fact, go to any village that's there in an area of no great people. Yeah, we'll take we'll take a look at that too. Yeah, thanks, Brother Chuck. Um, okay, so um, we're going to move on to Monday's lesson, and uh, it's entitled "Propaganda." So let's see if we can see what the propaganda is that they're talking about here. Um, Isaiah thirty-six two through twenty uh, is what we'll be looking at. Um, the rulers of Assyria were not only brutal, but they also were intelligent. Their goal was wealth and power, not simply destruction. Uh, why use resources to take a city by force if you can persuade its inhabitants to surrender? So while he was engaged in the siege of Lashish, Sennacherib sent his Rabeshka, which by the way, um, does anybody know that name there, what it is? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was also, what he was, was the, a, a cupbearer. Everybody familiar with what a cupbearer is? He's the one that tastes the king's things before the king gets to him. So in case it's poisoned, which that's how they used to do it back then, was a lot of poisonings. Uh, he was the one that would be the, the taste tester. And, uh, you know, if it was poisoned, well, he ends up dying. But he was also the field commander. He was also... Uh, like first in in command, first second, first. Okay, uh, go ahead, brother. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very persuasive and. Uh, uh, intelligent, as you said, uh, he was good with his words and uh, knew how to, uh, most of the time, you know, persuade people. And I say most of the time because this time that we're looking at did not work. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so, um, 
what arguments did uh, Rebeshka use to intimidate Judah? So 36, 2 through 20, 2 Kings 18, 17 through 35, 2 Chronicles 32, 9 through 19. Um, let's take a look and see if we can pull up some of the information here of what kind of uh, intimidation he used. Give me one second here. I apologize. I got to scroll up. Yeah. You don't give me your life. I'm going to pound on your head. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They were the bully. They were the bully. Um, okay, so uh, 36, 2 through 20. Um, let me see if I can just pull some of the taunts that he was saying. Uh, but let me just start from the beginning. It says, uh, Then the king of Assyria, the Rebshika, the with a great army from Lashes to, the, to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem, and he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And Eliakim, the son of Hekiah, who was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Then Rebeshka said to him, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? I say, you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of a broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to, to all who trust in him? Seven reads, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Uh, yeah, you know, he did break all the high places down. But were they God's places that he broke down? No. It was a lie. So here we see deceit. You know, he's using words of deceit to try to fool and trick the people into submission. Um, let me just read it just a little bit more. It says, Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses, if you, are able, if you are able on your part to put riders on them. So now he's taunting them and, and mocking them. You know, because remember at this time, uh, it, or Judah didn't have an army, or at least a powerful army. And they're coming up against a powerful nation that has a huge army. Multitudes and multitudes. Um, so he's taunting them and saying, you know, well, you know, uh, if you're able to put riders on them, on the thousand, uh, we'll give you 2,000 horses if you're able to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? I'm going to just leave it there. So um, these are some of the things that he came saying to him. Um, the rubbish, the Rebeshka made some rather powerful arguments. You cannot trust Egypt to help you because she's weak and unreliable. You cannot depend on the Lord to help you because Hezekiah has offended him by removing his high places and altars throughout Judah, telling the people to worship at one altar in Jerusalem. In fact, the Lord is on a serious side. There's another lie. You know, he claims that uh, the Lord said that he was on a serious side. <laughs> Did you have a question, sister? No, I noticed Comment? There were also claims in one of the Old Testament where the judge they were like spiritually vulnerable mm -hmm. because God warned them and took all their gods, false gods, of idols and worship. And then the people believe in that because there's a leader. And then come to our one, take them down. So they were competing. They mm -hmm. were Yes. So he did confuse the minds of the people. He, he was successful at that. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sister, for your comment. Um, so, uh, excuse me? 
Well, he, he wasn't successful, but he did confuse their minds. That's the part I meant that he was successful about. Amen. Uh, to avoid a siege in which you have nothing to eat and drink, give up now and you will be treated well. So he's trying to uh, get them to give up and uh, makes these promises that, uh, you know, if they, if they give in, I don't know if I read that yet. Uh, I think I read it earlier of what they would be given, you know, what he was trying to tell them they'd be given, but really tricking them because he says, you know, give all this up and everything will be good. And then we're going to come and we're going to, you know, basically take you into captivity. Indeed. Um, yeah, you know, when you think about war, and as we read earlier, you know, uh, they're not about going and just utterly destroying, because if you do that, then there's a lot of gain that you could have, you know, what they call the spoil, the booty. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes, play on the vulnerability of the people. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, and and by the way, who's the spirit behind this that's trying to deceive them, right? Right. Um, so the last part, uh, it says that uh, Hezekiah cannot save you. And because the gods of all the other countries conquered by Assyria have not saved them, you can be sure that your God will not save you either. So talk about intimidation, right? Really trying to break you down and thinking that it's a losing, it's a lost cause. Why even try? Um, okay. Uh, was the uh, Rebeshka telling the truth? That was the question we, that was what we just talked about, right? Uh, no, he wasn't truthful. Uh, he was mixing truth with lies, wasn't he? There was some truth to it, right? But the truths weren't accurate. Uh, exactly what Satan does, right? He takes one, he takes a lot of truth and puts in one tiny little lie. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, I'll just read the rest so we can go into Tuesdays. Uh, so was he telling the truth? Because there was much truth in what he was saying, his arguments were persuasive. Backing him up were two unspoken arguments. First, he had just come from Lashes, only 30 miles away, where the Assyrians were showing what happened to a strongly fortified city that dared resist them. Second, he had a powerful contingent of the Assyrian army with him. Knowing the fate of the armies in the cities elsewhere, 
uh, including Samaria and the capital of northern Israel, 2 Kings 18, 9 and 10, that had succumbed to Assyria, no Judahite would have reason to doubt that from a human point of view, Jerusalem was doomed. Uh, the rubbish... The Rebeshka also was right in saying that Hezekiah had destroyed the various places of sacrifice in order to centralize worship at the temple of Jerusalem. So we're seeing some of the lies and the truth and the mixed lies and truth. But had this reform offended the Lord, who was the only hope his people had left, would he and could he save them? It was up to God to answer this question. Okay. Any other comments before we go to Tuesdays? Okay. Tuesdays is, oh, so uh, we see what the propaganda was, all of that uh, narrative that he was talking to the people on the wall there, inside, the, or they were outside of the wall, on the, on the wall of the city that was built up and fortified, and they were down there as they were speaking up to them, actually. Um, so that was the propaganda we were looking at in, in Monday's lesson. It was... Uh, not, not all truth. It was mixed with truth and lies. Shaken but not forsaken. So we're still in 36, 21 through 37. Um, how did the clever orator of the Rebeshka affect Hezekiah and his officials? Uh, 2 Kings 18, 37 through 19, um, verse 4 is what we're going to be looking at mainly. And then, of course, Isaiah 36, 21, 37. Uh, 21 through 37, verse 4. Okay, so give me just one second again. You know, um, in this lesson, there was a lot of uh, L. G. White's notes. There's a lot to say about this, this study. Um, okay, so. Isaiah 36, uh, 21. Let's take a look at that. Uh, it says, but they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabeshka. Rabeshka. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. Um, so uh, they end up uh, covering themselves. Well, it says here that they, they, they rent their clothes or they tore their clothes when they told him the words that he had said when they came to Hezekiah and told him. So 37.1 through 20, just briefly, it says, And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself in sackcloth, and uh, went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, uh, Eliakim who was over the household, Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus saith Hezekiah, this day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Um, I'm going to fast forward to 5. It says, So the servant of the king Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, which the servant of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So moving forward in the story of what's going to happen is what's being said here. He's telling him what's going to happen to the king of Assyria. Um, it says that he's going to hear a rumor and return to his own land. Um, I was going to jump forward, but I'm not. Uh, so moving forward in the narrative, I'm going to go to 10. It says, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the king of Assyria has done to all the lands, but by utterly destroying them. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed? Gozan and Haran and Resaph and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Um, where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arp, uh, Arpad, and the king of the city of 
Sher uh, Sherefim, Hannah, and Iva. Uh, and 14 reads, I'm going to read four, uh, through and then I'm going to finish uh, th the rest of this. It says, And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Op and, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, the Lord, the king of Assyria, have laid waste all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood, stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, our Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdom of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. So Hezekiah gets this letter from the king of Assyria. And uh, he has the threats of what the king's going to do. And he takes it to the house of God, the Bible says. And he lays it out before him. He gets on his hands and knees and he prays to God of what we just read, you know, concerning this issue. And, I mean, isn't that awesome how he just takes something that's so threatening and he takes it and literally lays it out before God and then he prays over it and puts his faith in God and he's asking God, talk about faith and talk about going to God for everything. Um, Okay, so 37 says, Then Elikim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the, thousand, or the household, Shebna, the scribe of Joah, the son of Asab, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn in... Uh, I already read that. So, um, how did the clever orator of the Rabishka affect Hezekiah and his officials? Okay, so they went and they told him. They tore their clothes. Hezekiah sat in with his clothes torn in, in, in sackcloth. Um, shaken to the core in mourning and distress, Hezekiah turned to God humbly, seeking the intercession of Isaiah, the very prophet whose counsel his father had ignored, his father Ahab. Okay, so how did God encourage Hezekiah? So let's look at Isaiah 37, 5 through 7. How did he encourage him? What did you say, sister? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, any takers? Don't be afraid. I mean, how many times did Jesus say that when Isaiah was approached by God and said, Look, don't be afraid? That's right. That's right.
Okay. All right. Thanks, brother. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm going to read what uh, uh, 37, 5 through 7, how did God encourage Hezekiah? Uh, so the servant of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that, has, that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have been have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So we read that earlier, the same text, right? So God is giving him encouragement, just letting him know, hey, look, you know, this king's going to meet a, a bad fate here. He's going to end up dying by the sword. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to fast forward just a little bit, and I'm just going to just uh, talk about some of the narrative, what ends up happening next. Uh, Wednesdays is the rest of the story. Um, I, I'm going to read some of it first. It says, according to Sennacherib, as reported in his annals, he took 46 fortified towns, besieged Jerusalem, and made Hezekiah the Jew a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence like a bird in a cage. Um, so that's what was reported in Sennacherib's accounts, you know. And also, uh, I remember reading also that he had all these pictures of all these defeats of all these nations that he had, except for Jerusalem. And there's a reason why, of course. Uh, so uh, it says it right here. It says, but in spite of his uh, penchant for propaganda and an, extens an extension of his monumental ego, neither in text nor in pictures does he claim to have taken Jerusalem. From a human point of view, this submission is amazing given the inexorable power of Sennacherib and the fact that Hezekiah led a revolt against him, rebels against Assyria, had short life expectancy and gruesome death. Scholars acknowledge that even if we did not have the biblical record, we would be compelled to admit that a miracle must have taken place. Um, what ended up happening here in the story, as we go further into it, um, I'm going to read it right here. 36 reads, Then uh, the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp the Assyrians 185,000, and when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh, now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of uh, Nisrosh, his god, that his sons, uh, I'm not even going to attempt that name, and uh, Sherez, uh, Sherezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Eshadadan, his son, reigned in his place. So just as the Lord had said, he ended up, 
what, what happened was the, when he was going to make an attack on Judah, he had divided his armies because his army was so big. He divided those armies into two. He sent one up to Egypt to hold Egypt back while he was going to come and embark on, on Jerusalem. But in all of that, as we read, God sends an angel, an angel, to go and destroy. How many was it? He destroys 185,000. It says right here, the Assyrians of 185,000. Uh, so the angel of the Lord went out. Can you imagine? One angel goes and destroys 185,000 men. Talk about delivering God's people from the, the, the thing that they were looking at, their fate. Um, okay, so this is what ends up happening. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit on the bottom here. It says, in response to Hezekiah's prayer of total faith, God sent him a message of total assurance for Judah that, the, that boils over with the molten fury against the proud Assyrian king who had dared to defy the divine king of kings. So, yeah, you don't defy God, right, and try to go up against God. Yes, brother, go ahead. Uh, say that again. That, 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 that at, at yes. 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 That's right. That's right. Uh, what always gets me, though, is how God uses uh, his people's enemies against them. But then he goes ahead and he, because of, you know, I mean, these are nations that are idol worshipers. And, um, but it's interesting how God does that. Um, I'm going to just uh, read the rest of the bottom here. It says, also, if Sennacherib had conquered Jerusalem, and this is really interesting, he would have deported the population in such a way that Judah would have lost its identity as northern Israel did. From one perspective, then, there would have been no Jewish people to whom the Messiah could be born. Their story would have ended right there, but God kept hope alive. So... You know, had they been wiped out, they would have just totally taken no people for the Messiah to come to. I have to end it there. Uh, the story did continue with, you, you can go on and read that later about uh, how God, how Hezekiah gets uh, sick almost to death and then uh, God gives him a message of setting the sundial, turning it backwards. Okay, but anyway, let me just have a word of prayer as we finish here. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this time spent in your word and fellowshipping with, uh, with uh, our church family. Lord, I just pray that uh, as we leave here today, once again, that uh, because the stories can be so confusing, God, and you just want us to have clarity in all of the things that we read for understanding, uh, I just pray that we would go home and that we would study this lesson even further to, to really get it to sink into what the true message is of all of this, Lord. And uh, I thank you, Lord, and I just pray for our leaders today, Father, and our church services, Lord, that uh, you would bless them, Father. And uh, we, I ask for peace also today, Lord, and I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.